Video Conference. My name is Anne and I'll be your MC for today. Today's video conference is held in conjunction with the Cassini Scientists for a Day essay contest organized annually by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and several of our essay contest participants are here with us today. On behalf of our organizing team, I'd like to thank all our participants for taking the time to submit your essays during the exam and holiday period. We appreciate your enthusiasm and hope that today will be a great educational opportunity for you. As you know, the Cassini Scientist for a Day essay competition requires participants to choose from one of the three targets each year and to justify their choice by describing the scientific merit of their target. This year, the targets were the moons Dione, Iapetus, and Saturn itself. This year, we have invited two distinguished speakers from the Cassini mission, Dr. Alan Lee from Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Professor Ingersoll from Caltech. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our speakers from across the globe. Daniel will now introduce our speakers. Daniel, please. Hi, so uh, as Anne said, we are really honored to have two really experienced people who are working as our Cassini mission with us today. So on my right, you should get the camera, you should get the camera. Okay, so on my right is Dr. Dr. Alan Lee. Dr. Alan Lee received his PhD in aeronautics and astrophysics from Stanford University and is currently an engineer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. From 1989 until today, he has worked on the Cassini Hollis mission to Saturn and Titan, and for more than 20 years, he has supported the design, built, test, launch, and mission operations of the spacecraft. He has also supported other interplanetary missions such as the Mars Science Laboratory or Curiosity, the Galileo Jupiter mission, the Impact Kepler Telescope, the Mars Odyssey, and Dawn to Ceres and uh, let me see, to Ceres and Vesta. And for all, all that he has done, he has been awarded two NASA Exceptional Service Medals. On my left, and on, for, on the screen, you can actually see it on a different screen. So on my left is Dr. Andrew Indersall, who is a pro, uh, professor of planetary science at the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech. He's an expert on the weather and climate of Earth and other planets. And so after receiving his PhD in atmospheric physics from Harvard, he participated in many space missions, including Pioneer Jupiter Saturn, Pioneer Venus, Voyager, the Vega Venus Balloons, Mars Global Surveyor, the Galileo mission to Jupiter, of course Cassini, and Juno, which is on the way to Jupiter now. And among his various discoveries, he was also one of the first to suggest that a runaway greenhouse effect occurred for Venus atmosphere. Dr. Indersaw has served on the solar system expert Region Takedo Survey Committee. He was the chairman for the Division of Planetary Science in the American Astronomical Society, and he's also currently the Atmospheric Sciences Editor for the journal Icarus. He received the NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal and was, is also the Gerald P. Kuiper Prize winner for the Division of Planetary Sciences of the American Astronomical Society. So, yeah, we are very privileged, as I said, to have two really, really uh, prominent people with us as guests today. And you, you guys, just feel free to ask them any questions. And especially uh, Professor Indersol, we are offering a more scientific perspective to the mission, while Dr. Alan Lee will be offering a more engineering side. So it will be a very good opportunity for you guys to see from a different perspective for, of the same mission. So back to you, Anne. Thank you, Professor Ingersoll and Dr. Lee. Let us now move into the Q&A section. Oh. Sorry, into let us now move way. into the presentation. Oh, okay. So uh, first, we'll be having uh, Professor Ingersoll present about um, his work and what, what made, made what, what prompted, prompted him to go into what he is doing now. So give us a moment while he's set up. 
can go back to the oil or the that's the in high school and college was physics. But I didn't really um, know what kind of physics I liked best. And then I got a summer job at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution to study the physics of no, ocean. Sorry, sorry. I can't stand this poor suffering. <laughs> Uh, but I'll go on and tell you my, my life story in one minute. <clears throat> At Woods Hole, they were studying the oceans, the atmosphere, and uh, I said, well, this is the kind of physics I want to do. And so I went to graduate school and studied atmospheric science and uh, oceanography. But then, as I was just about to get my PhD, I realized that forecasting the weather every day might be boring. And uh, even though it was important, um, I much preferred solving puzzles about faraway places where we knew very little. And that made the puzzles more challenging. And so I turned to uh, mostly planetary weather, weather on other planets and some of the uh, questions there. And it looks like Daniel has done it. Well, you need to go remain in dispute. I can't, uh, you don't want me to turn on the slideshow. Uh, I, I haven't figured out how to yet. Right, that'll do it. Bang. Right. It doesn't show. Doesn't show, this is good. Yeah. It's a little smaller, that's all. As, as in, so, so they are only seeing this screen, as in this, this screen, so you actually need to like, uh, do this, like. Just go. In. Okay. Okay. So, um, as I as I said, I, I really um, in, I really uh, enjoyed the challenges of studying other worlds. Um, it's believe it or not, it is a practical thing. Um, first of all, we learn uh, about how the Earth came to be uh, by studying our neighbors and our planetary relatives, our cousins and sisters and brothers out there orbiting the sun. And, uh, uh, and that's an important question. How, how did we come to be here on Earth? Why is there life only on Earth? Could there be life on other bodies in the solar system? And uh, of course, could there be life on other planets around other stars. So uh, that's part of what we do. And, uh, um, it's a kind of intellectual entertainment. And um, you're, you're addressing questions that people have wondered about for probably a million years, as long as people noticed there were stars up there. Um, but <clears throat> Specifically, today we're going to talk about the Cassini spacecraft and some of the discoveries. And uh, here's a picture of Saturn taken, I believe, by Voyager, which didn't stop. It flew past Saturn on its way to Uranus and Neptune. And um, we all know about the rings of Saturn, and there are gaps in the rings. Let's see if I can show you a gap in the rings, right? There is a gap in the rings. And uh, the rings uh, are billions of tiny particles all orbiting uh, at their own appropriate speed, which is, depends only on their distance from Saturn. They bump into each other, and, uh, 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 but you might wonder, if they're bumping into each other, why don't they fill these gaps 
and that's because uh, there are moons pushing them away from these gaps. The moons might be outside, but uh, the moons push. Uh, they go. The moons go around more slowly than particles in the gaps, but the the, uh, the moon might go around exactly one half time while these guys are going around once, and so it's like pushing on a swing every other time, and it still uh, pushes the rings around and clears the gaps. There are many gaps in these rings because there's many moons going around Saturn. Um, here's another picture. Uh, this was taken with the sun behind Saturn. You can see the sun sort of like a sunset peeking out from behind Saturn. If, if Saturn weren't there, the sun would be about uh, about at this point. And uh, so uh, it's very tricky. The What was the most bright ring, which is right here, uh, is now the darkest ring because the, uh, the, the ring is so full of particles that it doesn't let the light through. Uh, also, it's not completely dark at night on Saturn because uh, the rings uh, th which are catching the sunlight here and here, the rings are actually shining down on the planet on the night side. If you were floating in a balloon in Saturn's atmosphere and you looked up at the night sky, the a night sky would be half covered with rings and uh, it would be brighter than a, the Earth's under a full moon uh, because the full moon, after all, is kind of a small disk in the sky and the rings would half cover the sky. Uh, and you can see a lot of these gaps at different places in the rings here. And you can even see a giant ring, which is, uh, actually we'll talk about it, but this giant ring is, uh, is there because one of the moons is an active uh, water volcano and it's spewing particles out into space and this is some of the particles. Uh, I think the moon is right there, but you can't see it very well in this picture. Uh, but let's talk, first of all, about the planet before we talk about the, the moons. And um, Saturn is usually very boring um, as, a, as, a weather, as a weather target. It usually looks like this, not much going on. Maybe there's a little hint of some clouds here. And everything you see is a cloud uh, because uh, there is no solid planet underneath. It's just a gaseous ball. But uh, every now and then, Saturn develops a giant storm. And it, they seem to come every 30 years, or uh, this last one came 20 years after the one before. And here it is developing. Uh, it, it, you can't see it, but there's a tiny dot there on December 5th, 2010. And uh, on that same day, the radio receiver on Cassini started hearing uh, uh, the static, electrical static, radio static from lightning. And then the static got greater and we watched the storm as it spread out, finally wrapped around the planet. And uh, it turns out, and then about six months later, it just, it died, it slowly died, ran out of energy. So uh, it's a very strange kind of weather. Um, after you, if you think about storms on Earth, they uh, come every week or every few days, and then they last for a few days, and then they're gone. Whereas here, uh, the storms come every 30 years, and they last for six months. And that's not even the same as on another giant planet, as on Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter has 300-year-old storms. And uh, figuring out why the different planets uh, weather is so different is one of the puzzles that we want to solve because it helps us understand the limits to forecasting our own weather and uh, why some of these storms here last for six months and uh, on our, our own planet they only last for a short time. Now uh, here's a picture of the lightning. We took a picture, we took images of this part of the planet. Uh, we were taking them every two minutes. And so this image from here to here, this is now a close-up of the storm. Uh, this was taken uh, in three filters to make a color. And uh, when the blue filter was, when the blue shutter was open, we saw this little blue dot. And then two minutes later, 
it wasn't there and the only conclusion is that it was a lightning flash and we saw it on the day side it was bright enough to show up and we saw a lot of other flashes this way just by photographing the same place twice and seeing a flash in one one time and not in the other from looking at the flashes we can tell how deep they are roughly because the deeper they are the wider the flash looks when it finally emerges from the top of the clouds and we can tell that these flashes are coming from a level in Saturn's atmosphere where it's wet there's raindrops there's hail there's snow there's water it's not liquid it's not a liquid ocean it's just water droplets it's rain and and it's dark down there but nonetheless you would at least recognize it as rain if you were floating in a balloon down there it'd be hard to float in a balloon in a hydrogen atmosphere but that's another problem now let's go on here's more examples of lightning we took over a 12-minute period we took these nine pictures of a little white cloud and you can see in some of the pictures there is a lightning flash and in others there isn't here there were two and it's it's to me it's quite amazing that something as common as lightning also occurs on other planets but that's not all the weather is very strange on Saturn here's a picture of the North Pole this was taken a few years ago when it was still winter in the north and since you can't see the pole it's not illuminated by sunlight in the winter there is this missing area in in our picture but even then you can see this hexagon it's a strange hexagon it's really just a jet stream there's a current that flows around this and exactly why it turns six corners as it goes around is kind of a mystery it's it's a little like the jet stream on earth but it's much more stable and that too is worth investigating to understand jet streams but that was a winter picture and now it's spring and we have this picture of the hexagon here it is it's it's about you could put the whole earth right in on one side and another earth if you had one or in the other side so it's it's a big thing it's not as big as Saturn by any means and at the center is this little bright area with winds whipping around in a counterclockwise direction and I'm sure you know that hurricanes in the northern hemisphere of earth go around in a counterclockwise the wind goes around in a counterclockwise direction and so in some way this is this little eye right at the pole is like a it's a northern hemisphere hurricane on Saturn but there are two differences one is this one is stuck at the pole it never drifts around and secondly it there's no ocean underneath and the ocean is very important to keeping hurricanes going on earth here's a close-up of that small area we're very proud of the sort of beautiful the the colors have been exaggerated and the colors are telling us the height of the clouds and these clouds here which are catching the sunlight are 75 kilometers higher than these clouds over here so this is like the eye of a terrestrial hurricane but much bigger and higher well that's all I'm going to tell you about Saturn itself but there's more there's some of the moons one moon in particular the the largest moon is called Titan and this is a picture of Titan against the silhouette of Saturn and you can see that Titan is rather boring it's covered with clouds we know it has an atmosphere we've known that for a while because when when the Sun is behind Titan you don't just see a crescent you see a complete circle around Titan and that is because the the atmosphere bends the light all the way around but with a radar you can peer through the clouds and see what's underneath and this is 
Oh, here, here, oh, I'm sorry. Here's a picture of the uh, of the the scattered light when the sun is behind Titan. It goes all the way around, and that's because the light is being bent by the atmosphere. If it was a, a planet with no atmosphere, it would just look like a uh, like the moon on a a new moon. So. Uh, with the radar, we peer down to the surface and we can make, uh, uh, we, we got this wonderful picture. We have a lot of pictures with the radar. It has rivers uh, coming together, flowing into this, uh, what looks like a sea. It looks like a lake. It has peninsulas and little bays. Um, it's a shallow sea because the, the radio waves can actually penetrate through some of the liquid. Um, the trouble is, uh, the temperatures down there are uh, unbelievably cold. Uh, it's not possible to have liquid water uh, at the surface of Titan. And uh, it appears that the, the liquid here, it is a liquid, but it's uh, natural gas, uh, also known as methane. Uh, on Earth, uh, methane is always a gas. Uh, you'd have to cool it way down to make it into a liquid. but. No problem on Titan. Uh, that's what we've got. We've got lakes and rivers of methane. Now there was a uh, parachute that parachuted probe, man-made man parachuted probe that dropped down to the surface of uh, on a balloon down to the surface of Titan. And this is a picture it took of the rivers uh, on Titan. And uh, these are rivers with liquid methane carving the channels. Uh, it's fascinating. It's, what, what we're learning is that uh, some of the possibilities uh, of uh, what weather could be like uh, when water is not the, the main uh, uh, hydrologic cycle. It's a, it's a different substance doing it. Uh, you can have sand dunes. These are, the radar took these pictures of a little, a little hill that uh, has wind blowing around the hill and leaving these sand dunes. OK, let's change the subject again to one of the moons. That's, this is the moon that I told you about with its water volcanoes. It's called Enceladus. And uh, uh, the, 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 when this picture was taken, it was summer in the south. And the south pole is about here, the south pole of Enceladus. Now uh, it's winter in the south, and this whole area is in darkness. But uh, there are these four cracks. One, two, three, four. And uh, they are erupting. Uh, there's water vapor and ice particles spewing out of these cracks. Let me show you a picture. Um, uh, this is now edge on. And you can see these uh, plumes coming out, uh, shooting hundreds of kilometers into the air. In fact, the particles escape the gravity of Enceladus and go into orbit around Saturn and become that giant ring that I showed you earlier. And uh, the big question is, if there's water vapor and ice coming out of these plumes, uh, could it be that there's liquid water down below the surface? Uh, and the liquid water is sort of like a, a geyser on Earth. Um, in the US, there's a geyser called Old Faithful that throws out lots of water. And if you uh, had Old Faithful on Enceladus, um, it would, the water would be spewing into the vacuum, and those, the water would freeze into little ice particles. So the question is, could there be liquid water down under the surface? And um, there's, we have evidence that the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, that's kind of an exciting uh, possibility, because uh, we, we have other measurements uh, that these plumes are not just pure water. They have mineral salts in them. They have organic molecules, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. And uh, in other words, we have all the chemical elements that you need for life. You probably have liquid water down below the surface. And you have energy, because uh, without energy, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't produce these, uh, these water ice volcanoes. So it's just conceivably possible that life evolved on Enceladus. Um, I'm not sure that we'll figure that out in our lifetimes, or at least in mine. But uh, we're going to go on exploring. And uh, we'd like to know uh, 
What are the possibilities for uh, the development of life? Uh, here's another picture, a close-up picture. You can see these plumes coming out. This is the uh, surface of Enceladus. And really, um, that's the end of my formal presentation, but I'd love to talk and answer your questions. All right. Thank you, Professor Intersol. And next, we have Dr. Alan Lee to give us a more engineering perspective of the mission. So uh, this would take a while for me to set up. So Dr. Lee will uh, start talking first. OK. I, uh, I did my uh, bachelor degree. Oh, we had that. Oh. I don't think that's I did my bachelor degree at uh, University of Singapore, and then I received a Canadian Commonwealth Scholarship, and I did my master degree in, in Canada, and finally um, uh, Stanford University quite many years ago. But I go back to, uh, to Stanford from time to time and uh, to give lecture and see my old professor. Many of them have retired. <laughs> Let me try to find a window, sorry. Take, take, take your time. I think Daniel mentioned earlier that I, I worked on Cassini for many years, but, uh, but from time to time, one way that JPL makes sure that uh, knowledge gained by one person from one particular mission is used on other mission is to make us as a reviewer of other mission. So in that sense, I make a contribution to other, other JPL mission and even, even mission from uh, the European Space Agency and uh, from other, other, other places such, such as uh, AP, APL. I think that's so, fair. Okay. should be that. Okay. Uh, can so, you guys see the PowerPoint? Can you guys see the first, power, first page of the PowerPoint? Yeah. Yeah, probably there's nobody there, the mic. You can see, right? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me let me start. Uh, I am on page one now, and you can see that um, this is a picture that I, that was taken of me from uh, during one of my conference by a colleague. Anyway, the first big bullet talk about that I work on Cassini for n quite a number of years, since 1989 or so. So it's more than 20 years from, uh, between that and today. And what do I do? Uh, I, 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 I do quite a number of different things, small things, but all engineering in nature. Cassini was launched because of science, because the scientists are curious, but our job as an engineer is to make sure that the, uh, the engineering aspect of the spacecraft is taken care of so that they can do their science. So, uh, so we do things like design, to build the spacecraft, test the spacecraft, hardware, software, etc., and and finally launch the spacecraft. And the launch, everybody knows, is on in, in October uh, 1997. And there are many many engineering events, uh, and some of the important one I will go through it uh, uh, in 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 a little bit of detail because they are more important. The uh, the the one of them is Saturn orbit insertion. And that happened on, on, on June 30th or July 1st, 2004. And then on Christmas Eve, or rather Christmas Day in, 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 Euro, in, uh, Europe, in Europe, uh, we released the Huygen Pro. And that is another important engineering e event. And on July, uh, January 15, 2005, we, we point the spacecraft to the, to the probe as it descends through the atmosphere of Titan. And then we, uh, I think Professor Engelso mentioned earlier about Titan, and there are many, many low altitude Titan, uh, Titan flyby. So our job as an engineer is to make sure that none of them will tumble. It will, the spacecraft will not tumble. If it tumble, we will not be able to collect signs. 
Similarly, we have to fly by, close fly by through the plume of Enceladus. And once again, we have to, we have to guarantee that nothing bad happened to the spacecraft. And uh, the second bullet talk about, near the bottom of the page, talk about the fact that I work on other missions, sometime in a significant way. Uh, for four years, I was the guidance, navigation, and control manager of the U.S. Uh, manned lunar lander Altair, and that is a second attempt of following the footsteps of Apollo and go back to the moon. And uh, that was uh, uh, um, proposed by uh, um, George Bush uh, Jr., but it was subsequently uh, cancelled by um, Obama. Uh, the second bullet talk about that I work as a reviewer so as, so as to share my experience with um, my other colleague working on other missions such as the MSL and this is the one that landed on Mars uh, just about August last year. And then I work as a reviewer for Voyagers, the Galileo Jupiter mission, Deep Impact and Kepra. We are, for example, working very hard to see what we can do to rescue the the, the spacecraft Kepler. Um, a lot of people is working on that right now. And finally, I work, uh, I also, I'm also supporting a mission operation of Mars Odyssey, Mars in, uh, Euro, the, designing the Europa spacecraft and mission operation of the Dawn. I, I push this, right? Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is a picture of uh, that cover a lot of things we design, we build, we test, we launch, and mission operation. And when I say we, we build, I mean I both, I, I mean both the, the hardware and the software. The software is sometimes even more difficult in terms of the number of people that I have to hire to do design and test the software. It's even more difficult than the hardware. And mission operation, we use the deep space antenna, uh, uh, which is, uh, you, you see a picture of that uh, at, the, at the right bottom corner of the, of the screen. So in the interest of time, I will move fast. Um, this is a picture of a very important event called Saturn Orbit Insertion. The, uh, the Cassini people call it SOI. And this is a timeline of SOI. Time start on the left-hand side. Um, for starting from the left hand side, you can see that the spacecraft, uh, its high gain antenna is pointed to the left, it's supposedly pointed to the Earth. So we are talking to the spacecraft at that time. And then the first step we have to do is to turn the spacecraft away from an Earth pointed attitude and point it in an orientation so that subsequently when it passes through the dust, pass through the dust particle of the ring, uh, the high gain antenna can be used to protect the rest of the spacecraft against any uh, hypervelocity impact. And we flew through a gap between the F and G ring subsequently, and then after that happened, we slew the, for, the second, for a second time, we slew the spacecraft so that the spacecraft, high, the, the, one of the main engine is oriented in the appropriate orientation, and we start the engine we fire it for about 96 minutes or so, and uh, that will slow down the spacecraft by about 2,000 kilometers per hour. That that is that is a that is a that is uh, the size of the so-called delta V, and that will allow uh, the Cassini spacecraft to be captured, to be uh, okay, to be captured by the uh, by the um, gravity of Saturn. And after that happened, that is the end of SOI. We and we are we we have a successful. We enter into the orbit around Saturn successfully, and and the scientists, such as the imaging scientists, they take advantage of the fact that the spacecraft is now very close to the to the uh, to the um, to the ring, and they take good looking picture of, of, the, of, the, of the ring, such as the one in, uh, on the right-hand side. Okay, so... Uh, uh, look at the camera. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is a, this is a picture of... Uh, uh, um, 
of my cell during the time of Saturn orbit in insertion. And because of the time delay, you know, we know that we have successfully entered into the orbit around Saturn uh, after a, a, a fairly long time delay. So we were very happy after we get the signal. Uh, next, next. Okay. Uh, so now I want to switch frequency to a second important event, something to do with the uh, Huygens probe. And this is uh, um, um, uh, uh, the top left, top right corner is a, is, a, is a picture of Christian Huygens and very, very outstanding scientist. And, um, and you can see the probe, uh, which is about 320 kilogram, is, uh, is piggyback on the, uh, on the spacecraft. And at the right time, our job, the engineer job, is to release it and let it fall um, on its own to, uh, to, to enter the atmosphere of Titan. Uh, I think Professor Engelso talked about two interesting, most interesting moon of, uh, of, of Saturn. And so that is the size, the, 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 starting from the left-hand left -hand side, the second one from the left is Titan. And Titan is actually bigger than our moon, as you can, you can tell. And, and, and Cilatus is uh, relatively small uh, relative to our moon. Uh, so I think, I think I'm going to skip this one, I think because uh, Professor Ingersoll has shown a lot of very interesting picture of, uh, of Titan. The most inter interesting part about Titan is that it has a thick atmosphere. And as a result, uh, this, this is the reason why we cannot uh, do much about it except to send a probe and, and which will travel through the atmosphere and gather information as it, as it goes down. Okay, but we, our job, uh, I mentioned earlier as an engineer, is to make sure that it, uh, the spacecraft will not tumble when we go through the, the atmosphere of Titan. And uh, we make estimate of the density of, the, of Titan we can estimate the density of Titan using engineering data. And the reason is because the higher the density, the larger the atmospheric torque imparted on the spacecraft, which means that the spacecraft thruster will be fired more frequently and more, in, more at higher duty cycle than before. So, so using the duty cycle of the thruster and the inertia property, etc., we can reconstruct approximately the density. And this is some of the work that we have done in, in um, oh, I don't know, 50 or 60 tit uh, uh, Titan flyby, as you can, you can tell here. Uh, the, the vertical axis is the density in, in, in log scale, and the horizontal axis is, is the Titan relative altitude. And this has been published in, in conference paper. Another guy, that, another moon that is exciting uh, is, is the Enceladus plume. And that was discovered in the year 2005. And, uh, and we also sort of see what is happening. Uh, the, the figures, the figures uh, the, uh, I, I, on, on the right-hand side, you can see that the attitude control error, for some reason, that at the time when, when I see this, I have no idea what's happening. But you can see that sometime after the Enceladus closest approach, which we call ECA, I see, I get a big spike, the, the green colors, big spike. So I ask around and I say, what, what is going on here? Uh, and and uh, it turned out that we are going through the plume at that time. And, and subsequently, using this kind of information, we can, we can estimate the density distribution of the, of the Enceladus plume. And I, we did a we did a paper on this, and this actually this paper actually received the so-called best paper award in the 2010 Guided Navigation and Control Conference, and it was on the modeling of the Enceladus plume that uh, plume jet density. I work on other missions also, uh, starting from the uh, top left corner. I work on voyages. I work on um, Dawn, which is uh, which is on its way to Ceres because it had just last year completed uh, uh, orbiting and studying Vesta, which is an asteroid, and is on its way to, uh, to Ceres, which is another one. And Mars Odyssey is still working, uh, orbiting Mars, and it is, uh, its main function is used as a relay sp uh, spacecraft uh, and, and 
sent to the Earth, data sent to it by MSL, the uh, Mars Science Laboratory. I work on the, the I, I review the work done by the, my European colleague, Isa Roseta, and it is on its way to a, uh, to a comet. And MSL, I think this, you guys know about that. And uh, the next one is Jupiter Galileo. And CrowdSat is uh, mission operation was done by the US Army. And uh, the lunar lander, and deep impact, and Mercury, Mercury uh, messenger. So in conclusion, space exploration is very challenging and very hard work. Uh, and, but it's very exciting and very uh, rewarding. And I, uh, the, the, the uh, top left corner, you can see a slide uh, sent to me by Weiling. And uh, that happened last year. And uh, I'm very happy that all of you are participating in this kind of activity. I think that's about all. Thank you, Professor Ingersoll and Dr. Lee. It was interesting learning about the intriguing weather patterns of Saturn, as well as the huge amount of intricate tuning needed to operate the Huygens probe and collect information. Let us now move into the Q&A section of the conference. As many of our SA contest participants cannot be present today but have pressing questions to ask our speakers, we will be reading their questions and recording this video chat to be posted online. Let us begin with a question from Ren Siyu of Raffles Girls School for Dr. Lee. Siyu would like to ask, what are NASA's future missions besides Cassini Huygens? What important knowledge do we gain by studying Saturn? And what do astrophysicists do in NASA? Dr. Lee, please. I think, um, uh, Andy, I think I'm going to ask you to answer the second and third question. But I will, I will just make a comment about the, the, the first question, which is, what are the NASA future mission beside Cassini? And uh, they, the feasibility of a Titan orbiter has been conducted, and I'm not sure whether it will be supported as a real mission in the near future. Uh, there is a mission that is uh, a project, is a real project, and it's the Mars 2020 mission to be launched in the 2020. And then uh, we, uh, JPL is working very hard on a, um, a, a mission to the uh, Jupiter moon, Euro the Europa. And, um, and there are many other smaller uh, missions that I, I, I don't think I want to mention it. But uh, I'll, I'll try my best in uh, half a minute to answer the uh, what important knowledge do we gain by studying Saturn? Uh, well, I, I, I tried to say uh, we, it allows us to study processes that we're familiar with on Earth, but we see those processes in a much broader context. Uh, we see lakes and rivers where the liquid is not water. We see weather patterns that last for hundreds of years. And uh, that tells us about how those processes work. I'm particularly interested in uh, why we're only able to forecast the weather on Earth uh, five days ahead. Uh, and yet we can forecast the weather on uh, Jupiter and Saturn months or even years uh, ahead because the storms last so long. Your third question, uh, what do astrophysicists do in NASA? I suppose by astrophysicists you, you mean as distinguished from planetary scientists, which I am. Uh, they study everything from the Big Bang of the universe um, to uh, black holes, in, uh, they, they study, uh, they look back in time and look at the uh, universe when it was young because the, it's taken that long for the light to get here. Uh, and then in our own galaxy, um, there's sort of a, 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 a collaboration between planetary scientists and astronomers 
to look for planets around other stars. And uh, uh, right now they've found, uh, well, they've found for sure um, hundreds, perhaps a thousand for sure, and uh, uh, good evidence for another thousand, and the number keeps growing. Uh, and of course, that tells us that's that's that tells us whether planets are common uh, or whether they are rare, and it tells us whether life might be common in the galaxy or. Perhaps we're the only life in the galaxy, but you need a planet, and uh, if there are a lot of planets, it, it in increases the uh, probability. Thank you, Dr. Lee and Professor Ingersoll. The next question will come from the floor. Students, do you have any question? You can ask any questions about, um, okay. uh, you can press the green button on the mic. What is a planetesimal? Oh, Andy, what is a planetesimal? Please a planetesimal is a uh, planet that hasn't yet become a planet. It's a, uh, it's uh, when, when the uh, solar system formed, uh, there was a dense cloud of gas and, uh, and dust, and we see dense clouds of gas and dust in the galaxy. Uh, and if it got dense enough, then it uh, began to pull itself together under its own gravity. And uh, uh, it, the gravity just kept pulling and compressing things, and you get a lot of little particles of dust. And then the dust pulls in more material, and uh, pretty soon you have uh, small, tiny planets. And so uh, at some point in the history of our solar system, there were not just uh, eight planets and a bunch of asteroids. There were uh, millions of planetesimals, which were very small objects, and they uh, either crash together and form bigger objects, or they uh, gently bump together and pull themselves together because of their gravity. And uh, uh, that is how that sort of assembly of planetesimals into full-sized planets is uh, how, we, how we came to be. And we can see lots of evidence that that's the way it happened. We can, some of the evidence is when we look at other stars, and some of the evidence is just looking at meteorites and uh, the planets themselves in our own solar system. Does it include Earth? Does it include Earth? Let me ask you to clarify. Does what include Earth? Is Earth did Earth form in this way? The answer is yes. Um, <laughs> it's likely that. Earth's moon formed from a collision between the, some of the last two planetesimals in our immediate area around the sun, and uh, that uh, some uh, fairly large object, not as large as the Earth itself, uh, but a fairly large object crashed into the moon, and uh, we could call that a very large planetesimal, and uh, some of the debris from that collision became the moon, and the rest uh, fell back onto the Earth, and probably some of it went off to orbit the sun and crash into something else. But it was that those final collisions of the very large planetesimals is how, we, how all the planets formed. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ingersoll. Um, the student, would you like to introduce yourself? Please let us know your name and the school you're from. Um, my name is Gargia. I'm from Yobarthi International School. Okay, thank you, Gargia. The next question will be directed to Dr. Lee. This question is from Brati Prolusai Gargia and Bailo Anusha Anand from Yuvabrathi International School and Torbun Kiat from School of Science and Technology. They would like to know whether men will live on Saturn in the future. Can we colonize Saturn? Well, I think uh, <laughs> uh, 
Sorry about that. Uh, but I think Andy, uh, Professor, has uh, mentioned earlier that uh, there might be some misunderstanding. You know, unlike Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, they all have a solid surface. So there is a possibility of um, landing on Mars or the Moon or, or, or the Earth. But, but, uh, but Jupiter, Saturn, they are gas giant. There is no solid surface. For you to land on is a if a big ball of helium or and other other uh, other ch chemical, so so there is no way you can uh, you can live on 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 um, on, um, on Saturn. But but that doesn't mean that you cannot use remote sensing instrument to study it. You don't have to land on it to study it. You can you can you can study it remotely. Um, you know, so for example, um, uh, imaging, radar, etc. So you can you can you can you can study it still in spite of the fact that it's just a big ball of uh, gas. Thank you, Dr. Lee. You, you might have uh, better luck landing on a moon of Saturn. Um, Titan has, after all, Titan has an atmosphere. Uh, there's not much oxygen in the atmosphere, and it'd be unbelievably cold. But uh, at least you could land there, and uh, with a proper space suit that kept you warm, you could walk around, and the pressure would be a little higher than Earth's atmospheric pressure, but not much higher. And uh, the winds might uh, blow on the surface, so y you might feel comfortable in your space suit. Thank you, Professor Ingersoll. Um, the next question will come from the floor again. Students, do you have any interesting questions? Don't be shy. Uh, <laughs> press the green button. You need to press the green button. All right, all right. Please Hi. introduce okay. yourself. Okay, I'm Zhuo Bing from National University of Singapore. So I'm just wondering whether there's any instances that the science and the engineering requirements of your scientific missions conflict, and if they do, um, how do you go about resolving them? Thank you. Uh, didn't quite understand. I, think. I didn't quite understand it, but are you saying uh, you are asking about engineering challenges and how we overcome them? Uh, okay, um, it's more like uh, because one of you is a scientist and one of you is an engineer, so sometimes uh, I just wonder whether the scientific requirements and the engineering requirements of the missions conflict with each other, with each other. and whether this, um, how are these oh. conflicts resolved? Oh, the conflict between, um, well, um, in ge sometimes, sometimes, uh, so um, the, the, I think it is, uh, I mean, we, we know this will happen way before we launch the spacecraft. And, and, and my understanding is that um, engineering requirement and safety of the spacecraft is always top priority. I, I'm going to just quote an example, and I think, Andy, you can supplement what I say. Uh, I and the manager for attitude control subsystem, um, so, I have to guarantee that the spacecraft will not tumble, will not be tumble when it flew through the altitude, uh, the, uh, low altitude of the tit Titan, and then there is a dense, uh, there is an atmosphere. So the scientists, they always wanted to go low, 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 very low, like 600 kilometer, 500 kilometer, and but. But but the thruster the thruster has got a very limited magnitude, and and the lower you go, the higher the density and larger the atmospheric torque, which is imparted on the spacecraft and it can tumble the spacecraft. So my job is always to communicate and explain to the scientists my concern, and um, and at the same time while I'm telling them and trying to convince them not to do it. 
I also will have to, what if they still want to do it, and I will have to make sure that the fault protection system will be able to recover even when the spacecraft tumble. So, um, so I think I think it is not to the advantage of anyone, including the scientists, to have a spacecraft tumble. And, and so, so it's uh, sometimes there's this kind of conflict, and uh, we speak different languages. They speak science language. I speak engineering. So, so at the end of the day, is to understand each other vocabulary and 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 come to a happy um, uh, compromise. I think Andy, why didn't you just? You know, you, you, you portrayed the engineers as the people who say no. <laughs> but actually, uh, you guys often pull off miracles. And uh, the scientists are always uh, terribly grateful for your enthusiasm and your help to, uh, to do things that uh, at first look impossible. So uh, uh, you aren't the guys who say no. You are the guys who, uh, who make things happen. So thank you, uh, Professor Injersaw and Dr. Lee. The next question comes from Yasha Lai from SST. And the question is, are there any hypotheses about the hypothesis two very different hemispheres and diff in terms of the colors and brightness? And what are these hypotheses for? And there will be for Dr. Injersaw. People uh, speculated, is, uh, is Iapetus a dark moon covered with a white material, or is it a white moon covered with a dark material? Uh, and uh, <clears throat> when the spacecraft got close, it was pretty clear that uh, we did have frost on the ground, and uh, the frost tended to uh, uh, cover the places that didn't get as much sunlight. That makes sense. Frost would uh, evaporate if it got too much sunlight. So uh, it looks like. Uh, frost is the main, it, it, it looks like it's really frost on a dark moon. Uh, uh, and uh, why is it uh, on one hemisphere and the other? Um, apparently the moon collects, of course the moon is zooming around Saturn, and uh, some of the other moons are throwing material uh, into space, and the moon uh, sort of collects material on one side, the side that uh, is basically the forward side in its motion, and uh, so it uh, has eventually developed a different, uh, uh, different color. Thank you, Professor Ingersoll. Students, any further questions? Oh, hello. I am uh, Joseph from the Faculty of Science here at NUS. And it is my understanding that Saturn is currently going through a transition in its seasons, like uh, cause um, I think one of the other poles is warming up right now. So uh, what do you expect to see as Saturn transits from one season to the other? Well, as I said, it's, uh, it's now springtime in the northern hemisphere. Um, I would love to see another giant storm, but uh, uh, we can't predict them, and they seem to take uh, 30 years to repeat, so I'm not very optimistic about another giant storm. Uh, but Saturn seems to develop smog in the summertime. Smog is what we have in Los Angeles here. Uh, uh, there are uh, organic molecules in the atmosphere. There's methane. and. Uh, uh, the methane turns into more complicated carbon uh, carbon molecules, and uh, those form little particles. Uh, and uh, we're watching the seasons change on Saturn, sort of the way uh, the uh, the atmosphere of Earth changes from winter to summer. And there's chemical changes, and uh, the summer days on uh, on Saturn seem to be a little like the smoggy day, smoggy summer days in Los Angeles. Thank you, Professor Ingersoll. The next question will be directed to Dr. Alan Lee. This is a question from Wei Hongpeng from Bukit Panjang Government High School. What are the challenges faced in Cassini Huygens mission, and what makes a space mission a successful one? Uh, let me just, uh, I think 
just repeat the question. Uh, what are the challenges faced in Cassini Huygens mission and how we overcome it and make it make the mission successful? The future. Uh, future. The, uh, make a, a space mission a successful one. Well, I, the, the only, uh, there are many, many small things, but uh, I think I will try to see whether I can uh, mention a few of them and, uh, and hopefully you appreciate the the creative thinking the engineer and the navigator um, uh, used to uh, overcome this difficulty. The first, the first difficulty we have is that Cassini is very heavy. At the time of launch, it's about 5,500 kilograms, and it is too heavy relative to the capability of the launch vehicle. So what does that mean? It means that it is going to take a long, long, long time to go to Saturn. And we don't have patience to wait 10 years, 15 years. So how do we do? We use the so-called gravity assist. And um, we, make it, we do gravity assist and use the Venus gravity field, the Earth field, and the Jupiter field. And we, we arrive at Saturn in 6.7 years. That's still a long time, but it's, but it's, it's the best we can do. So, so the, the heavy weight of the, uh, of the, of ca of the Cassini spacecraft uh, is one difficulty that we overcome by, uh, by doing creative thinking. It's either that or we have no mission. Okay, so um, the, the, another example is uh, the, the challenge faced by, um, um, by, by the, uh, faced by the engineer in overcoming the Titan atmosphere. You know, the Titan atmosphere is denser than the Earth. So we, when we flew, when we go through it, there is a possibility of tumbling. And the, to avoid that, thruster must be fired. But the thruster system we have is a blowdown system. At the time of launch, its magnitude is about one Newton. And one Newton, 4.45 Newton is one pound. So one Newton is not much and it decay continuously with time. So by the time of arrival at Saturn uh, and also subsequently by Titan, the thruster magnitude is very small. So, what, so we anticipated that and we, we decided to put in the engineering plumbing system, the propulsion system, we have a so-called a recharge of the of the mono propellant tank assembly, and we is we using this recharge, we increase the thruster magnitude from a decay value of about 0.7 newton to about one newton, and that will allow us to go through Titan in a safe way. And um, uh, another yet yeah, one more example is that um, because of there are so many moon. At, uh, at Saturn, and then there's a ring, and all this moon and ring, they are not supposed to enter the field of view of the star tracker. The star tracker is used by the attitude control team to, to generate knowledge about the inertial knowledge of the, of the spacecraft. But they, they, you know, it's like, it's just like uh, uh, the sun shining into your eyes, the moon, etc. When they go into the field of view of the star tracker of all this moon and, and ring of, of Saturn, that is not acceptable. So the way we do it is that uh, this is a lesson we learn from uh, from the from uh, from voyages. That the way we do it is that from time to time we suspend the attitude determination using the star tracker and we just propagate the the, uh, the attitude information using just a gyroscope. So we anticipated that and we found, created a, a solution for it and we, we practiced it. So we are not, uh, we are not concerned that the moon, uh, the moon or the ring, et cetera. So, so these are some of the examples that, uh, that when you are faced with the challenge, you think outside the box, you think creatively, and you check your, uh, your, con your, your um, a potential solution and pick one and, and then put it into practice. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Next will be another question from the floor. 
Any question from Global Indian International School, uh, School of Science and Technology? Okay, the girl in red, please. Please turn on. Yeah. Hi, my name is Aditi. I'm from VIBIS. Can you uh, speak so closer to the mic? Hi, uh, my name is Aditi. I'm from VIBIS. Uh, I wondered. Uh, I know that there are different theories as to how Saturn's rings actually formed. So, if it were if it were possible to, because I found that they are the ring particles in Saturn rings, Saturn's rings are actually like few micrometers to a few ma meters in diameter. So if it were possible to actually transport these back to Earth and study them, would it help determine actually when the rings were formed? That would be uh, a difficult uh, engineering job to bring them back to Earth. <coughs> um, there are really two theories about Saturn's rings, uh, <clears throat> and uh, one is that the rings are a moon that never pulled itself together. It was too close to Saturn. There's sort of a limit if you if you uh, if you have a bunch of particles orbiting far enough away from a planet, then the gravitational attraction of those particles to each other. Uh, is stronger than the effect of uh, the, the planet's gravity, and the, the, the particles pull themselves together. It's actually a competition between the, the particles' own attraction to each other and the tidal, the tides from the, from the central planet. Uh, but when the particles are too close to the planet, uh, the tides win, and the, and the um, particles never pull themselves together into a moon. So that's one theory, that the particles have been there all the time, and they just couldn't form into a moon. The other theory is that uh, uh, the particles are constantly uh, f getting drifting into Saturn's atmosphere and disappearing, but they get uh, <coughs> uh, um, replenished by comets and asteroids that crash into the rings and break up into small particles. And so that theory says that the rings are constantly uh, being uh, 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 renewed by uh, collisions from outside. Uh, um, you said that like sometimes the gravity between the ring particles is greater than the gravity between the ring particles and the planet. So why don't these uh, particles just clump together and form moons? Um, it's really not the gravity of the planet because, after all, if you're orbiting a planet, uh, if you're an astronaut in orbit around the Earth, you feel weightless uh, because uh, your motion cancels out the Earth's gravity and so you feel no actual gravity. Your, your stomach is, uh, <laughs> feels, uh, you get nauseous when you're an astronaut in orbit because you feel so weightless. Uh, but the force on your feet, if your feet are pointing towards the planet, the force, on, the gravity force on your feet is just a tiny bit larger than the gravity force in your head because your head's just a little farther from the planet. And that difference is all that you have left from the planet. That's all you have left of the planet is that difference between your head and your feet. So it's not such a strong force. and. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, and, and so the, the rather weak gravity uh, of one uh, little planet or one little object to another can uh, can be larger than that force of the uh, tides on uh, of the planet's gravity. But <clears throat> it's a contest, and the uh, the uh, the attraction of the bodies to each other will win the contest if the bodies are far enough away from the planet. <clears throat> and you can't form, but if they're too close, then you can't form a moon. The, uh, the tides will win, and, and they'll just rip apart any moon that tries to form. We, thank you, Professor Ingersoll. We have time for one last question before we move on to the prize-giving ceremony for the 2013 Cassini Scientists for a Day essay contest. So 
One last question to the floor. Yeah, what is the difference between the igneous rocks in the Earth and Vesta? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the difference is. <clears throat> igneous rocks, of course, require a, a hot interior. It has to be molten, melted rock at some point, and um, I think I, I, I think. Uh, it depends on the history of the melting, that, and that changes the chemical composition. But I don't know enough about the uh, igneous rocks of Vesta. I, there are some meteorites that seem to have come from Vesta, but I'm not, I'm not very uh, educated about that subject. Thank you, Professor Ingersoll and Dr. Lee, for joining us today. I'm sure our audience has learned a great deal about Saturn and space exploration in the past hour. We would like to invite Daniel to present each of you with a token of appreciation. Daniel, please. So, is, is the camera face properly? Oh, so cute. So, so uh, for Professor Ingersoll, we actually have, we'll be presenting him with a pen holder. So, th thank you, Professor Ingersoll, for really helping us with this event. <coughs> And for doc Dr. Lee, we have a, a name card holder. So th thank you, Dr. Lee, for helping us for the second year for this event. And actually, let me take it out so that you guys can actually see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee and Professor Ingersoll. We have now come to the point that we've all been waiting for, the prize-giving ceremony of the Cassini Scientists for a Day Essay Contest 2013. So this year we saw 48 participants from eight schools submitting their essays about Dion, Iapetus, and Saturn. And they had to justify why they felt that their target had the most scientific merit. It was a close fight between many qualified participants, uh, and we would like to thank everyone for your effort. So we would like to first thank all the schools who participated. Um, some are not here today, so we'd just like to acknowledge the ones who are. Please send one representative from your school to collect the certificates of participation from your, uh, for your school. First, we have Bukit Panjang Government High School. Thank you. Yes, pose for the camera. Next, we have the Global Indian International School. Next, we have the School of Science and Technology, Singapore. And finally, we have the Yuva Bharati International School, Singapore. Thank you to all the schools. Now, in recognition of the many high-quality essays that we received, We'd like to present the following participants with awards of honorable mention. They are Jean Ouyang from Bukit Panjang, <laughs> Koparti Sandeep from SST. 
Ko Siji from Bukit Panjang. Nitin Bala Subramaniam from GIIS. <laughs> Ren Siri from RGS, which will be collected by one of her fellow schoolmates, Doreen. Sim Yu Yang from Bukit Panjang. <laughs> Siva Kumar Jananya from uh, Yuva Bharti, which will be collected by her schoolmate Gargaya. Yan Peiling from SST. And Zhang Liang from VJC. We would also like to acknowledge the honourable mention winners who are not here today, uh, Chao Zijie, Lu Wenyu and Sneha Vihot. Congratulations to all the honourable mention winners. And finally, the top three winners of the Cassini Scientist for a Day Essay Contest 2013. In third place, we have Elaine Wijaya Oi from Raffles Girls School Secondary. <laughs> Elaine is unfortunately unable to join us today, but we have her schoolmate, uh, Doreen, all, who will also be collecting on her behalf. <laughs> In second place, we have Nian Fei from Bukit Panjang Government High School. Nian Fei is also unable to join us today, so we would like to ask a schoolmate to also come and collect on her behalf. And finally, we have the winner of this year's contest. She was actually also a winner last year. We have Prinita Mukherjee from Bukit Panjang Government High School. Congratulations, Prinita. Well done, and congratulations to our three winners. Our winners' photos and essays will also be posted on NASA's JPL webpage um, for the international winners of 2013. Now we have one last award to give out, and this goes to the school with the highest total aggregate score of all its participants. That means you had to have a lot of participants, and they had to have written really well. And this is the Cassini Explorer Award, which goes to 
the School of Science and Technology, Singapore. Congratulations. We'd like to invite their teacher, Ms. Sue, to come and collect the award on their behalf. Thank you, Ms. Sue. With that, we are almost at the end of this year's video conference session. Before we conclude, we'd like to invite all participants up to the front for a group picture with our speakers in the background. So can all participants please move up to the front? Thank you.